skip a small section, but I do want to say, just before my very brief conclusion, that two of the at least three faculty members in Africana Studies who have uh, related interests, uh, get, our interests can be summed in this poem, Big Zeb Johnson by Everett Hoagland. I'm referring to one of the others that I'm referring to in my department is Edward Wallace, who is a public health professor. And he has explained that in public health, um, where his specific emphasis is public health in the African American community. And so as, as he's explained, in serving the interest of the African American community, the place where public health and medical humanities overlap is in family storytelling. Right, it's um, when the community gathers to tell a story, uh, when the community, um, when members of the community can tell stories about illness within their own, own family, within their own line, it, it can also, like for their own family line, it can be compelling um, and in a very practical way. And so I think this poem, Big Step Johnson by Everett Copeland, is very illustrative of this. Mother's father, red brown, raw bone, Virginia born, Indian blood, from whom I get my 6 4 size, died of diabetes during the White Depression, leaving three high strung, violin colored daughters and brotherly loved widow, Aunt Tootsie, who I later as firstborn, man child, grandchild, named Mama Wawa, who also sick with sugar, wound up worn out from taking in the world's wash waiting for that great getting up morning with one leg sweetly mad in an old World War I wicker wheelchair and died of diabetes. I am because you, unemployed and blue, sugar-blooded, through those old TB and pneumonia times never let the three, not one of their six small feet, get wet or cold when the chilling, killing colorless, colorless flakes fell one or two or three feet deep. You took your knife edge steel coated shovel a pace ahead of their inner row gossip gate, and odd eyes scoffed. Window shades went up, curtains parted, and witnessed to such love. Philly folk watching you dig down to the slate and brick sidewalks, melt metal on stone sparks, and phosphorescent snow, sun powder glinting over and around, fire aura crowning the big bent over, upright, steaming, exhaling, dry shack fast locomotive of a man going like 60, leaning into the labor, fathering, fathering the whole long, cold mile of school. Diabetes be damned. Your neighbors came to count on this. Courtly care, their kids following yours on a row. Those we told winter mornings so many miles and years ago. Today, the you and me, through genes and oral history, speaks of the gray-haired rigors of the long haul going on 60 as I deal with my own three worrisome brown sugar teenage daughters and live with diabetes. And so in the final, um, just by way of final summary, I'd like to return to the question of a formalized medical humanities program, its purpose, and the, and the community it serves. I return to the example from John Luby. Uh, his grandmother, who was a midwife. And uh, what I wanted to add to this is, well, on one hand, uh, we certainly get the idea of how the, uh, the community gathering around um, was a support, uh, and perhaps uh, physically so, for in the life of the women who were going through childbirth, right, that somehow they would feel better just by the presence of multiple community members. And yet, it's not ultimately just about patient care. That in some way, in this process, in, in this storytelling process, it's also about the health of the community itself. And I think that this is a good metaphor for us here at UC as we sort of engage in the medical humanities endeavor at whatever official or unofficial level we want to get in, involved. That it is ultimately um, for about our students, um, our younger um, faculty, our, our graduate students, uh, but also about uh, some level of the health of our own research community. So thank you.